Hey everyone, welcome back to the next day of summer school. And today we're going to be continuing to read Ban This Book. And we are on page 29 today. So if you remember from yesterday's chapter, um, our main character, Amy Ann, is a big book nerd. She loves her books. And unfortunately, her favorite book has been banned from her school library. So now what she is going to do is she's going to go to the school board meeting this upcoming Thursday, and she is going to talk to the school board about why this book should still be in their school library. And we'll have to see what happens from there. And we also learned a little bit more about Amy Ann and how it seems like she likes to be alone and she doesn't seem to fit in or feel like she can fit in really well with her family or her friends. But she does have one best friend, Rebecca. So let's see what happens next in this chapter. Um, this chapter is called Common Sense. And today we're going to be reading from pages 29 to page 47. So let's get started. Thursday came quick, and suddenly Dad was driving me to the school board meeting in his truck. The school board meeting where I was supposed to tell everybody what I like from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler. With every mile that passed, I regretted open, opening my mouth a little bit more. The school board meeting was in a room on the third floor of a big gray building downtown. There was a curved table at the front where some of those school board members were already sitting, and two sections of uncomfortable seats facing them, with an aisle running down the middle. And right at the front of the aisle was a podium with a microphone on it, the microphone I was supposed to get up to and talk into. The folded piece of paper with the speech I'd written about from the mixed up files crinkled in my pockets. I've only ever stolen one thing in my entire life, a lollipop. From the grocery store when I was four, I had snatched it when I was in the checkout line and stuck it in my pockets. But I was old enough to know I was wrong. That lollipop felt radioactive the whole way out of the door and into the parking lots. I felt like everybody could see it, like everybody knew I was a bad girl. It burned so hot that I broke down in tears and confessed before we ever got to the car. That piece of notebook paper in my pocket felt like that now. I was surprised it hadn't set off all kinds of alarms on the way into the building. How was I ever going to stand up and read what I'd written in front of all these people? Mrs. Jones, the librarian, saw us come in and hurried over to give me a hug. She was wearing a black dress with white polka dots tonight and a big black polka dots for earrings. Oh, honey, I'm so glad you came tonight, she said. Amy Ann's our own honorary librarian, she told Dad. I think she spends more time in the library than I do. I was suddenly worried Mrs. Jones was going to let it slip that I hung out there every afternoon instead of going to clubs. She didn't know that I had been lying to Mom and Dad. She held out her hand to Dad instead. Opal Jones, she said. Opal's a pretty name, Dad said, shaking her hand. Mrs. Jones blushed. Grown-up ladies always act weird around my dad. Mom says it's because he has bricklayer arms and a movie star smile. My parents gave me an interesting first name because our last name was Smith, Mrs. Jones said. Then I went and got married to a man named Jones. She shrugged. What can you do? So, what's all this about book banning? Dad asked. Mrs. Jones took a deep breath. She had big lungs to fill. It's not the first time we've had a book challenge in the library, but it's the first time the school board has gone over my head to pull a book from the shelves all by themselves. And it's all because of that woman there. Dad followed her gaze to a petite, pretty woman with short blonde hair. She wore a matching lavender skirt and jacket. She doesn't look like a book burner, Dad said. That is Mrs. Sarah Spencer, a pillar of our fair community, Mrs. Jones said. She's a member of the Shelbourne Elementary PTA, the Shelbourne Elementary Playground Redevelopment Committee, the Raleigh Race for the Cure Foundation, the North Carolina Art Museum Board, and the North Carolina State Opera Society. Oh, my dad said, suddenly interested because of the opera. My stomach seized up and I grabbed his arm. I did not want him to start singing at the school board meeting. Most importantly, said Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Spencer and her husband are rich, which means the school board listens to her even more than they listen to me, the person they hired to do the job. I didn't know Mrs. Spencer, but I knew the boy in the seat beside her. His name was Trey. He was in Mr. Vaughn's 
fourth grade homeroom with me, but he and I had a little history. He had the same blonde hair as his mom, only messier, and one wore an untucked blue polo shirt and jeans. He looked up from the notebook he was drawing in, caught me staring at him, and quickly looked away. One of the school board members called the meeting to order, and we sat down with Mrs. Jones. The seats in the audience weren't even half full. The board members talked about some boring stuff that only future lawyer Rebecca would have had been interested in, and then it was time for public comments. That meant people could come up to the podium to speak. I sank down in my chair a little, the paper in my pocket crinkling louder than firecrackers to me. Dr. Opal Jones is our first speaker, one of the school board members said. I sat up. She's a doctor? I whispered. Not a medical doctor, Dad said. Library science, probably. There were library sciences? My eyes went wide as I imagined librarians and lab coats looking at books under microscopes like crime scene investigators on TV. Wild-haired library scientists cataloging books with giant machines that crackled with electricity. Mad library scientists whirling new words around in glass beakers. I was so busy imagining what it would be like to be a library scientist that I missed most of Mrs. Jones' speech. But... Worse than ignoring the request for reconsideration forms and the whole system the school board put in place to review challenges to books, Mrs. Jones was saying, is the larger question of intellectual, intellectual freedom. Some of the school board members rolled their eyes and shifted in their seats like we all do in Mr. Vaughn's class when he started telling us how we're all going to need to know how to use fractions one day. So we better pay attention. Mrs. Jones didn't seem to notice. And right here, I want us to stop and think about, I wonder how the rest of this board meeting is going to go. Because as a nine-year-old, do you think that you would be able to go up in front of a huge room full of all of these adults and tell them why your, your favorite book should still be in the library? Sounds like a really scary thing to do, especially if you're shy, like our character Amy Ann is. So I'm really curious where this is going to go. All right, let's continue. Um, we're near the last paragraph of page 33. It's our job as educators to expose our children to as many different kinds of books and as many different points of view as possible. That means letting them read books that are too easy for them or too hard for them. That means letting them read books that challenge them or do nothing but entertain them. And yes, it means letting students read books with things in them we might disagree with and letting them make up their own minds about things, which is downright scary sometimes. But think what good education is all about. Some of the school board members were shuffling papers and checking their phones. None of them seemed to be paying much attention to her. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Jones said, every parent has the right to decide what their child can and can't read. What they cannot do is make that decision for everyone else. I respectfully ask that the school board overturn their arbitrary closed door decision to remove these books and to require any parents still concerned about library materials to follow the established reconsideration policy set up by this board. Thank you. Most of the school board members were looking at the table in front of them when she finished, not at Mrs. Jones. One of them coughed. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Mrs. Spencer, you wanted to speak? Trey's mom went to the podium. Unlike Mrs. Jones, she didn't have a piece of paper to read from. And I wonder what the difference between these two arguments is going to be, because Mrs. Jones seems that she is pro any type of book being in the library and that we should just let students decide what is right and wrong for them. But it seems like Mrs. Spencer is on the other side of the argument and she is against these books and wants some of them banned. So which side of the argument are you on? Are you pro books being banned or are you against it and kids should just make the choice? Ladies and gentlemen of the school boards, I grew up in this country. I was a student at Shelbourne Elementary once, she said, and no, I won't say how long ago. A couple of the school board members laughed. Back then, the school library was a safe place, a place where parents could trust that their children weren't going to pick up a book that taught them how to lie or steal or cheat. They weren't going to find a book that told them more about their bodies than they were ready to know at the age of 10 or 9 or 5. They weren't going to find a book that showed them it was all right to talk, 
back and be disrespectful to adults. Call me old fashioned, but I don't think school should be a place where a parent's authority is undermined. I think it should be a place where it's reinforced. I frowned. No book I read in the library had taught me to lie, to steal, or to cheat. Every kid who had any kind of brains knew how to do all that stuff already. And I was respectful of adults, so I always did whatever they told me to do, even when I knew it was a load of pony poop. Mrs. Jones never used the word censorship, but it was there behind everything she said, Mrs. Spencer said. I'm not for censorship. I'm for common sense. We have to protect our children. It's not censorship to keep things away from children that aren't age appropriate. It's common sense. I'm sure Mrs. Jones would call it censorship to keep adult magazines filled with S-E-X out of her library. S-E-X. Who was she spelling that out for? Did she think the kids in her room had never heard the word before or that we couldn't spell? This is just 11 books, Mrs. Spencer said. That leaves thousands more in the elementary school library for our children to enjoy. Far better books, too. I have only asked to remove these books that are inappropriate or have no redeeming value. You made the right decision to remove these books from the library, and I hope you can trust in your own wisdom and common sense as parents. To see that no child is ever exposed to them again. Thank you. Besides us, Mrs. Jones cleared her throat and shifted in her seat. Thank you, Mrs. Spencer, one of the board members said. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to this issue? He asked. Mrs. Jones looked over at me and smiled. Dad gave me a questioning look. This was it. This was why I had that piece of paper in my pocket. Why I got my parents to rearrange their schedules to bring me here. Why I was in a boring meeting at 7 o'clock on a school night instead of sitting in my bed reading a book. They both expected me to get up and say something, to tell the school board why they shouldn't ban Mrs. Frank Weiler. All I had to do was stand up and walk to the podium. Anyone? The school board member asked again. The school board waited. Mrs. Spencer waited. Mrs. Jones waited. Dad waited. I sucked on my braids. All right, then, the school board member said. There being no further comments on the matter, I move to uphold this board's decision to remove these books from the Shelbourne Elementary School. Seconded, someone said. No, no, I was supposed to say something. I wanted to say something, but I hadn't. I couldn't. And at this point, what do you think is going through this girl's head? Why can't she say anything? This is obviously such a big issue for her. Why can't she say anything? What's going on in there? What do you think? All in favor? Aye, a bunch of them said. All opposed? Nay, two of them said. Motion carries. Anyone else have another issue they'd like us to hear? And in this situation, when um, they ask all in favor and there's people that say aye, what that means is just yes. So when they say all in favor, aye, and a bunch of them said yes, that means that just a bunch of them raise their hands at yes. Nay, or when they say all opposed, and the people that say nay, that those are the people that say no. So there's two people that said no, we don't want to ban these books. The rest of them said yes. All right, let's continue on. And just like that, it was over. One of the other adults in the audience got up to complain about how much homework her kids brought home, but I was barely listening. That was it. My one chance to speak up, my one chance to tell them why my favorite book was so great. And I had done what I always did. I sat there and said nothing. My face was so hot. I thought it would catch fire. I grabbed onto the bottom of my metal chair on both sides and hung on. I couldn't even look at Dad or Mrs. Jones. The school board moved on to talking about bids on plumbers for another school, and my dad huffed. I don't think we need to sit around for the rest of this. We've already wasted enough time. I nodded, trying not to cry. I'm going to wait to the end, Mrs. Jones whispered, bend the ear of one of those two board members. Good luck, Dad told her. I looked at up at Mrs. Jones as I slid past her down the aisle. I'm sorry, I told her. Oh, there's nothing for you to be sorry about at all, honey, Mrs. Jones said. She took my hand and squeezed it and didn't do anything. I know, that's the problem, I wanted to say, but I didn't. Oh, that's such a sad chapter. How are you guys feeling after that chapter? Because I know that made me a little bit sad. So I wonder how this character feels and where she's going to go with this now. Because we're still at the beginning of the book. So I wonder where Amy Ann 
we'll go. So maybe she'll have some character development. Let's see. All right, the next chapter is called Mixed Up Mrs. Frankenfurter, and this is on page 39. In the car, on the way home, I pulled the piece of paper out of my pocket and unfolded it. At the top I had written, Why from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler is my favorite book. What I had written below, that wasn't long, but it had taken me a long time to do it. How do you say why you like a thing? You can point to all the good parts. That you like how they ran away from home to a museum. That you like how Claudia packed her clothes in an empty violin case. That they slept in a big antique bed and took baths in the fountain. That they solve a mystery about an old statue. I like all that stuff about from the mixed up files. But none of those is really the reason I've read it 13 times and still want to read it again. That's something bigger, deeper, more than all those things added together. How do you explain to someone else why a thing matters to you if it doesn't matter to them? How can you put it into words how a book slips inside of you and becomes a part of you so much that your life feels empty without it? Is that your speech? Dad asked. Why didn't you read it? Dang it, Amy Ann. I thought that was the whole reason we came all the way out here tonight. The whole reason we rearranged everybody's schedules. Your mother and I have a lot better things to do with our time. Hot tears poured down my cheeks and I turned away so Dad couldn't see. I tried to swallow a quiet sob, but Dad heard me. You cry? Oh, Amy Ann, I... I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I know how hard it is for you to speak up. He pulled a bright red bandana out of his pocket and handed it to me. Here. What's the book? I shook my head. I couldn't look at him. I was still crying. Come on. Mixed up Mrs. Frankenfurter or something. He was trying to get me to laugh, but I was too upset. He was right. Everybody had changed their plans for me. And we come all the way downtown on the school night, and I sat there too afraid to say something. Dad didn't say anything else, but a few minutes later we pulled into the parking lot for the bookstore. I hadn't even noticed we weren't driving home. Come on, Dad said. Clean yourself up now, and let's see if they have your book. Inside, I told the lady at the register the name of the books, and she knew it right away. A few minutes later, Dad bought me my very own copy of From the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler. There you go, Dad said. Now it doesn't matter whether they have a copy in the library or not. You got one of your own. On the way home, I held the book in both hands in my lap. The cover was a little different from the one in the library, and the Newberry medal on the front wasn't real like the library one. It was just a picture of the gold medal, not a sticker you could run your fingers over and feel the bumps, even through the clear plastic cover. But what didn't matter really, the book and the pictures inside were the same. I was glad to have my own copy, but I couldn't help thinking about that book that wasn't on the library shelves anymore and how I would never have known from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler was my favorite book if I hadn't found it there in the first place. And I want you to stop and think because this is a really good point that Amy Ann brings up is that yes, this is her favorite book and she can get her own copy of it. But she would have never known about this book of hers, this favorite book of hers, if she never got to rent it from the library. So think about maybe a book you got from the library. Maybe it was one of your favorite books ever. And yeah, you could ask your parents probably to buy you a copy of that book. But would you want other kids to never be able to read that book? To never be able to read it in a library? How do you feel about that? I want you to keep pondering that question too as we continue reading. So we're on the next chapter and this chapter is called The Girl with the Mullet and we're on page 42. Sometimes I'd like to pretend I'm the main character in a book. My mom and dad and sisters and Rebecca are all characters too. Mrs. Jones, maybe. And Mr. Vaughn, my teacher and the other kids in my class, but I'm the main character. I'm the one who explains everything that's happening in my own voice. The one things happen to. The only problem is the best books aren't the ones where stuff just happens to the main character. The best books are the ones where the main character does something, like run away to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And that's why I could never really be the main character in the book. That's kind of funny though, right? I never do anything. I stuck my bookmark in from the mixed up files right at the point where Claudia and Jamie collect $2.87 in coins from the restaurant fountain in the museum, and I watched out of the window of the bus as it took me to school. 
I already read all the way through my new copy of From the Mixed Up Files once already, before I went to bed. We stopped at Rebecca's house, and she flopped down in the seat next to me. How was the school board meeting? She asked. I shrugged. You would have liked it. They said, make a motion, and I second that. A lot. Robert's Rules of Orders, Rebecca said. That's what they're called. It was written by Robert somebody or other? No kidding, I thought, but I didn't say so. Did you read the thing you wrote? Rebecca asked. I looked out the window. No. Amy, and you worked on that all week. I shrugged. Mrs. Jones talked, though, right? What happens? Nothing. All the books are still banned. Rebecca saw through the book. Saw the book in my hand. Isn't that the one of them? Rebecca took the book from me and looked at the cover. You're all the time talking about what great a book this is. What's so bad about it? Nothing, I told her. That lady said it teaches kids to lie and steal and cheat, but they don't do any of that stuff. Only now that I thought about it, they do lie about running away to the museum, and Jamie does cheat at cards. And I guess you could call it stealing when they take the coins from the fountain. Well, I kind of do, I guess, I said. Rebecca's eyes lit up. Cool. Can I read it? I was surprised. All the times I talked about from the, mix the mixed up files, Rebecca had never once been interested in reading it. Until now. Okay, I said. I pulled my book bookmark out and gave it to her. Only don't lose it. Rebecca looked pleased with herself. She started flipping through it to look at the pictures. I grabbed the book and closed it. Don't look ahead. You'll spoil it. Danny Purcell leaned over the back of our seat. Hey, are you guys talking about the books? Trey's mom got bands. Rebecca blushed the way ladies do around my dad. She liked Danny. Only she never said so. But sometimes when I was talking to her in class and I realized she wasn't listening, it was because she was watching Danny. I didn't get it. Danny was nice and he was good at sports in gym class, but all he really seemed to care about was his hair. He had a big football helmet of hair that he wore down to his eyes like the frosting on a cupcake. And he was all the time combing it down with his fingers to make sure it was swirling the right way. I saw the list in the newspaper, Danny said. You read the newspaper? I thought, but I didn't say it. I read that list, Danny said, and I realized I know one of these books, you know, like not from class. It took me a while, but then I remembered why. We own one of them. It's on this bookshelf in my house. It's been there for like forever. I parked up. Which one? Danny threw his head back to flick his hair into place. Something about waiting for a girl. I don't remember, but the cover has this girl with a mullet talking to a ghost. What's up, my mullet? I asked. It's when your hair is short in the front and the sides, but long in the back, Danny explains. The hair expert. Girls don't wear mullets, Rebecca said. Well, this one does. I tried to remember the other books on the list. Is it, wait, Till Helen Comes? That's it. Mom said it was like her favorite book when she was a kid. Man, I hope she never had a mullet. That is not a good look. Wait Till Helen Comes was one of the books on the list I hadn't read. Can I borrow it? I asked. Rebecca and Danny both looked at me in surprise. Uh, sure, yeah, Danny said. I'll bring it tomorrow. Rebecca looked lasers at me like I was interested in Danny, too. Just want to read this book, I told her. I want to read it, too, she told Danny. I squinted at her. Did she really want to read it, or was she just saying that because of Danny? Danny shrugged. Okay, sure, I'll bring it tomorrow. You can read it after me, I told Rebecca. You've got from the mixed up files of Mrs. E. Basil Frankweiler to read first. Why do you guys care so much? Danny asked. Are these books really good or something? The, they have to be, Rebecca told him. Why else do you think they banned them? I took a few seconds, but the truth of the finally got through Danny's thick helmet of hair. He nodded. Yeah, yeah, I bet they're full of good stuff. Like all those channels my parents block on the TV. You can borrow this one when I'm finished with it, Rebecca said, waving from the mixed up files under his nose. Now it was my turn to shoot lasers from my eyes. Who said she can loan my books out to other people? All right, cool, Danny said. And he sat back in the seats. I lifted my hands at Rebecca as if to say, what gifts? But she just blushed again. Whatever, at least now I could be sure she would actually read it. The bus pulled up to the school and I hauled my backpack into the aisle. That's when I saw who'd been sitting in the front of us. Trey. 
He must have gotten on while I wasn't watching. How long had he been sitting there? Had he heard us talking about his mom and the banned books? Had he heard me loaning mine out and asking to borrow Danny's? Trey flipped a sketch pad close, put it in his backpack, and slid out past me. He gave me a quick look as he went back, but didn't say a word. What was that supposed to mean? That he had heard us? Was he going to rat us out to his mom? Danny nudged me along, and I followed Trey off the bus. I'm being stupid. So what if we were reading the books Trey's mom had banned from the library? They weren't library books. They were our books. And nobody but my parents could tell me what books I could and couldn't read. Mrs. Jones had said so, which gave me an idea. And that is where we're going to be leaving off for today. I hope you guys are still enjoying this book. And we will continue with the next 20 pages tomorrow. I will see you guys later. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.